Israel could be responding as early as Monday to Iran's unprecedented retaliatory attack on Israel over the weekend. U.S. President Joe Biden says the U.S. won't take part in any Israeli counterattack. Following the ruling party's crushing defeat in the general election last week, President Yoon song yeol will give a live address tomorrow at a cabinet meeting. Eyes are on what message he will deliver about reform. Semiconductor exports in March show a robust performance for the fifth straight month, leading South Korea's tech sector forward. It's April 15, 2024. This is News Center. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yoon Jung Min. Iran's unprecedented retaliatory attack on Israel over the weekend is fueling fears of a widespread war in the Middle East. U.S. reports say Israel could be responding as soon as Monday. Moon hye leads us off. Following the first ever direct overt attack against Israel by Iran from its own territory on Saturday night, involving more than 300 missiles and drones, global leaders are responding with urgency in a bid to ease escalating tensions. The Wall Street Journal reported that U.S. and Western officials are anticipating retaliatory action by Israel as soon as Monday, but are pushing to prevent hostilities from spiraling further out of control as Israel weighs its response to the attack. U.S. President Joe Biden warned that Washington would not participate in any counteroffensives launched against Iran and would only continue to assist in defending Israel, after it helped to shoot down most of the missiles launched on Saturday alongside other allies. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told his counterparts in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Turkey over separate phone calls to reiterate Washington's stance. However, White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said that what happens next is up to Israel to decide. It's going to be up to the Israelis to decide uh, what, what the next step is here. I will just say this. President Biden, since the beginning of this conflict, has worked very hard to keep this from becoming a broader regional war. Leaders of the wealthy group of seven nations convened a meeting and unanimously condemned Iran's attack. In a statement released by the White House following the meeting, the leaders said that they had demanded Iran seize its attacks and that they stood ready to take further measures in response to future actions that could destabilize the region. The attacks are seen as a response to a suspected Israeli strike on Iran's embassy compound in Syria earlier this month that killed top Revolutionary Guards commanders and after the months-long war in the Gaza Strip that has led to the loss of thousands of civilian lives. That being said, the damage wrought on Israel was minimal. An Air Force base was reported hit but operational, and a child injured by shrapnel. Moon Hye-ryeon, Arirang News. The international community was quick to respond. The UN Security Council held an emergency meeting over the weekend in New York, where there was a major face-off between ambassadors from Iran and Israel. Kim jong shu has this report. An emergency meeting upon the urgent request of Israel took place on Sunday local time at the UN headquarters in New York. Ambassadors from Iran and Israel both appeared with Iran claiming the justification of its military strikes on Saturday, saying it only targeted military objectives and were carried out carefully to minimize the potential for escalation. Iran's operation was entirely in the exercise of Iran's inherent right to self-defense as outlined in Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations and recognized by international law. The Israeli ambassador to the UN, on the other hand, strongly condemned Iran, saying he has warned continuously and asked the Security Council to take concrete action against Iran's Ayatollah regime. Iran, the number one global sponsor of terror, has exposed its true face as the deist destabilizer of the region and the world. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for maximum restraint, saying now it's the time to defuse and de-escalate. The Middle East is on the brink. It's time to step back from the brink. It's vital to avoid any action that could lead to major military confrontations on multiple fronts in the Middle East. Most member countries, including South Korea, have urged all parties concerned to come up with measures to prevent further escalation. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. 
Also in related news, Korea's breaks on fuel tax will remain in place for two more months amid the fresh outbreak of violence in the Middle East. Our economics correspondent Lee Soo-jin has more. The South Korean government has decided to extend fuel tax cuts through June as growing tensions in the Middle East are expected to lead to soaring global oil prices. That's according to the opening remarks made by Finance Minister Choi Sang-mok during an emergency economic meeting on Monday. Depending on how the situation continues to develop, risks surrounding energy and supply chains and the volatility in the finance market may grow. As such, the government will remain vigilant and establish a pan-governmental emergency response system to respond accordingly. The government's announcement means that the 25 percent cut in fuel tax has been extended two more months after last being extended through April and February. This cut, which has been in place since January 1st, means fuel tax is currently 615 won, or roughly 44 U.S. cents per liter, rather than roughly 59 cents per liter. This means consumers can save roughly $18 a month on fuel. The decision comes as Iran launched hundreds of drones and missiles toward Israel on Saturday night, 12 days after an Israeli strike on the Iranian embassy complex in Syria. While most of the strikes were reportedly intercepted by Israel and its partners, it has increased fears over a broader war. The government will also maintain the 37 percent fuel tax cut on diesel and liquefied petroleum gas for two more months. With this, the tax on diesel stands at 27 cents and LPG at 9 cents. The finance minister also said that pan-governmental efforts will be made to monitor both domestic and global economic trends in real time to prepare for a range of possible scenarios. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. In other news, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, met with South Korea's Defense Minister Shin Won-sik in Seoul on Monday to discuss cooperation against North Korean threats. The U.S. envoy explained that Washington is exploring alternatives following Russia's recent veto on renewing the U.N. panel monitoring sanctions on North Korea. She called for close cooperation from allies, including South Korea. The envoy also held talks with Foreign Minister Cho Taer on the same day. The meetings were held as part of her four-day visit to Seoul. This is the first trip to South Korea by a U.S. ambassador to the U.N. since 2016. Following the crushing defeat of the ruling party at last week's general election, President Yoon will make a live address during a cabinet meeting tomorrow to set out how his administration will undergo reform. Our presidential office correspondent Woo Soo-young has the details. President Yoon suk yeol will deliver a live message on Tuesday, laying out how his administration will reform itself after the general election last week handed the opposition an unprecedented majority in parliament. Yoon's officials told the media on Monday that the president will personally convey his remarks on the outcome of the election during the weekly cabinet meeting on Tuesday, rather than hold a press conference or make a televised address to the nation. The leader released a brief statement last week through his chief of staff, vowing to reform his government's management of state affairs and to focus on improving the economy and people's livelihoods. Yoon's speech is likely to set out a more detailed course of self-reform and how his administration plans to work with an opposition-held parliament for the next three years, as his major policy initiatives hang in the balance. Yoon's officials have hinted the reform will start with a major overhaul of senior figures in the administration. Once the candidates have been screened, the president is set to name a new chief of staff and prime minister after they offered to resign last Thursday, along with all his senior secretaries. While Yoon previously appointed former civil servants as his chief of staff, the incoming candidate is likely to be a political heavyweight who can skillfully work with an opposition-held parliament and make astute responses to major domestic issues and crises. The rumoured candidates are Transport Minister Won Yi-ryong, former opposition leader and National Unity Committee Chair Kim Ang-gil, 
lawmaker Tang Jae-won and Interior Minister Lee Sang-min. More high-ranking staff, including senior secretaries for press, society and political affairs, are expected to be replaced. But the chief of staff for policy and senior aides for economy and science may retain their positions for continuity. Appointing a new PM could take longer, as it requires parliamentary approval. The likely candidates include Kim ang once again, as well as former Unification Minister Kwon yong tae and ruling party lawmaker Chu Oh-young, who are re-elected for their fifth and sixth terms respectively. To fully reform the management of state affairs, his office is considering a major cabinet reshuffle and the restructuring of the presidential office to make it more receptive to public opinion. This could involve resurrecting the position of senior secretary for civil affairs or creating a new division to facilitate better engagement with parliament and the public. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News. Now to the latest in the standoff between the government and doctors. For the first time since the general election, the government has reiterated its commitment to expanding the medical school admission quota, while trainee doctors are accusing the government of an abuse of power. Our Song Yujin reports. It seems there's still a big hurdle to overcome in the standoff between the Korean government and trainee doctors regarding the expansion of the medical school admission quota. During Monday's Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters meeting, Health Minister Cho Gyu-hong said the government's will for medical reform remains unchanged. This includes a planned increase in the medical school admission quota by 2,000 from next year to tackle the country's shortage of doctors in essential medical fields and rural regions. We'd urge the medical community to stop their collective action and promptly engage in dialogue. We have a tight timeline considering the college admission schedule for 2025. The college admission guidelines for the 2025 academic year will be finalized next month, including the medical school quota. Making changes to the quota after that will be impossible. While standing firm on the expansion, the minister mentioned the government's openness to discussing rational and unified alternatives, echoing its previous stance, which hinted at the possibility of adjusting the scale of expansion. However, trainee doctors remain strongly opposed to the expansion. 1,360 trainee doctors who have submitted their resignation letters announced on Monday that they would file a complaint against Minister Cho and Second Vice Health Minister Pang min with the Corruption Investigation Office for high-ranking officials for alleged abuse of power and obstruction of the exercise of rights. They're saying the government misused its power to block hospitals from processing their resignation letters and force them to work against their will by issuing return-to-work orders. One of the seven requests trainee doctors made to the government to return to work in February was the complete removal of the expansion plan. Song Yujin, Arirang News. Shifting gears, Korea's ICT exports continue to rake in profits, expanding for the fifth month in a row in March, driven by a tangible recovery in the semiconductor sector. Shin Sebyuk has the latest trade numbers. Semiconductor exports have sustained double-digit growth for the fifth consecutive month, driving South Korea's tech sector forward. Data released by the Trade Ministry on Monday shows that ICT exports in March rose 19.4 percent on year to nearly 18.8 billion U.S. dollars. This marked the fifth consecutive month of year-on-year -year increases for the nation's tech exports overall and the third straight month of double-digit growth. According to the ministry, chips led the charge, with exports reaching $11.7 billion for an increase of 34 percent on year. The growth in the artificial intelligence market has significantly boosted demand for semiconductors. Recovering demand for IT devices such as mobile phones and PCs has also propelled chip exports to their highest level since June 2022, when they hit $12.5 billion. Other sectors also saw robust growth, indicating a strong recovery in overall ICT exports. Shipments of displays climbed more than 13 percent on year as both OLED and LCD panel exports were up. Computer exports also recorded a 20 percent year-on-year increase, marking three consecutive months of growth. But the mobile sector as a whole saw its exports tumble by 7 percent compared to the previous year to $220 million due to a weakened global demand for mobile phone parts. 
by country, China remains the largest market for exports, with $8.4 billion worth of shipments in March, up 32.5 percent from last year, and marking year-on-year -year growth for the fifth consecutive month. Vietnam and the United States followed with exports of $3 billion and $2.3 billion, respectively. Meanwhile, ICT imports for March stood at $11.7 billion, leading to a trade surplus of just over $7 billion. Shin Sebyuk, Arirang News. Samsung Electronics topped the global smartphone market once again in quarter one this year, mainly due to good sales performance in its recent Galaxy S24 series. According to a market research firm IDC on Monday, Samsung accounted for more than 20 percent of the total market share with over 60 million mobile phone shipments in the first quarter. Its rival Apple, which was first place in quarter four of last year, accounted for some 17 percent to come in second. Chinese manufacturer Xiaomi ranked third place. The Netflix comedy drama Beef has won the 2024 Writers Guild Award in the limited series category. Korean-American director Lee Sung-jin was awarded for his contributions to the screenplay. The 76th annual ceremony was held simultaneously in New York and Los Angeles on Sunday, honoring outstanding writing across various media platforms, including film and television. Beef has now swept three of the major four Guild Awards in Hollywood this year. It won a Producers Guild of America Award, while lead actors Ali Wong and Korea-born American actor Steven Yeun dominated the Screen Actors Guild Awards for their outstanding performance in their respective categories. Over in New York on this Monday, former U.S. President Donald Trump is scheduled to stand in a criminal court on charges of bribery to suppress a scandal ahead of the presidential race in 2016. No former U.S. president has sued in court as a criminal defendant in American history. Lee sung covers this latest development and its broader implications. Donald Trump will become the first former U.S. president to ever stand before a criminal trial with his lawyers, prosecutors and Justice One Merchant set to pick jurors in a New York courtroom on Monday to hear evidence on charges related to allegations that he paid hush money to prevent a sex scandal ahead of the 2016 presidential election. Trump has been indicted on 34 felony counts for falsifying company records linked to money allegedly paid through his lawyer Michael Cohen to prevent the disclosure of his past sexual relationship with a former adult film star Stormy Daniels just before the 2016 presidential election. While Trump faces a total of four criminal trials, this is the only criminal case scheduled for trial before the November presidential election. Trump has strongly denied the allegations of manipulating his company's accounting figures and that he had a sexual relationship with Daniels. He has claimed that the allegations are politically motivated by the Democrats. As the defendant in the criminal case, Trump must appear in court throughout the trial scheduled four days a week, excluding Wednesdays for about six to eight weeks. So much time spent in court could be a crucial setback for the former president at a time when he should be focusing on his election campaign. While Trump's team of lawyers have made an all-out effort to postpone the trial until after the presidential election, it was not accepted by the court. Each of his 34 indictments carries the possibility of a four-year prison term, with Trump certain to appeal any guilty verdict and sentence. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. Time now to take a look at what's been happening in the world of sports. Joining us in the studio is our sports editor, Paul Neen. Hello, Paul. Hello there. Let's first start with Major League Baseball. It has been yet another busy weekend for Kim ha -sung. Yes, very productive indeed for him. His San Diego Padres beat the LA Dodgers two games to one in the series. On Sunday, in a game that the Padres went on to win 6-3, Kim drew four walks. That's the most he's achieved in a single MLB game. In the game before that, which the Dodgers won 5-2, Kim Ha-sung hit his third double of the season. It came with the Padres 4-1 down in the top of the seventh inning with no runners and two out. 
He hit a sinker from starting pitcher Gavin Stone. On Friday, the first in the series, and a game that the Padres won 8-7, he hit a solo home run off the highest earning pitcher in MLB, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. It came at the top of the second inning to give the Padres a 3-1 lead. Fans got their money's worth with this one as the game was won in the 11th inning. Meanwhile, Lee Jong-hoo of the San Francisco Giants was able to extend his hitting streak to a career-best six matches. He went one for five with a steal and a run scored on Sunday in the Giants' 9-4 defeat to the Tampa Bay Rays. His run was his seventh of the season and third in as many matches. All right, and moving on to golf now, um, the Masters, a career best for An Byung Hun. Yes, that's right. He finished tied for 16th at two over par. This places An as the highest ranked Asian golfer at this year's Masters and it was his best finish in what was his fifth appearance at the opening major of the year. But only the top 12 are invited back for next year's Masters. He missed out by a single stroke. American Scotty Scheffler won the tournament outright, his second green jacket at Augusta National. He finished at 11 under, four strokes clear of Sweden's Ludwig Oiberg. Meanwhile, Kim Shi-hu and Kim Joo Hyung finished tied for 30th at five over. Uh, to football now, uh, there are brand new champions of Germany. Yes, Bayer Leverkusen on Sunday sealed their first ever top division title in Germany. The first in the club's 120-year history. Leverkusen are also the first new champions of Germany since 2009 when Wolfsburg won the Bundesliga that year. And it's the first time that a team other than Bayern Munich have won the league since 2011. The title was sealed on Sunday following a 5-0 win over Werder Bremen. Leverkusen now have 16 points more than their Bavaria rivals Bayern Munich with just 15 points left to play for. Leverkusen are led by Spanish manager Xavi Alonso, who has been linked with Liverpool to replace Jurgen Klopp and Bayern to replace Thomas Tuchel, but now looks set to stay with the club. When he took over in October 2022, the team was second bottom of the table. Remarkable. Finally, to badminton, a long overdue win for South Korea at the Asian Championships. Yes, the team of Lee so hee and Baek Hana on Sunday won the women's doubles title. That's a first for Korea in 19 years since Lee Gong won and Lee Kyo Jung in 2005. In Nanjing, in China, the pair beat Zhang Shuchuan and Zheng Yu 2-0, 23-21 and 21-12. This comes after the pair also won the All England Open last month. In the mixed doubles, Korea's So Sung Jae and Che Yu Jong finished runners-up to the hosts, China two sets to one. It looks like all boats were well for the Olympics coming up later this year. Uh, thank you, Paul. See you next week. Thank you. See you. Rain is falling across the country, suiting the dryness. Rain continued during the day today, but the rain clouds will gradually recede by the end of the day. Looking at the amount of rain, the southern, southern coast of Gyeongsangnam-do province will have the most rain concentrated at up to 60 millimeters. As the rain clouds gradually move eastward, the rain will gradually die down in the western parts of the country. Early summer heat came over the weekend. The soaring high temperatures have been dampened by the rain. Today's daytime temperatures were 5 to 10 degrees lower than yesterday, back to the levels of previous years. 
Warm mornings will be seen all over the country tomorrow. Seoul, Daejeon, and Gyeongju at 12 degrees Celsius. By tomorrow morning, most of the rain will have stopped and skies will be clear again. Daily highs will move up to at least 20 degrees nationwide. Warm weather will continue throughout the week. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world. That is News Center for tonight. Thank you for watching. A panel session coming up.